okay, here's the start of a frame. You can see, like, there's how the tree grew, like, it's a natural V. We just cut it off there. I joined the parachute regiment and I hated it. And no matter where you are in the world, the Arctic, the desert, the jungle, the sea, it's always the same protection, location, acquisition, navigation. If this falls down or lets in the rain, we've got to rebuild it. So let's do it right first time. The British Army issued something like this, which is equivalent to a hammer. I found the jungle with delight once you got used to it. So um, we'll see how purple it is, but it does your feet good like that. Getting them to catch a few fish, put up a shelter. Well, cock that one up then. Yeah. Lofty, how are you, brother? Yeah, fine, Chris. Yeah. Great to see you, mate. It really is. It's been a while since I've seen you on the te telly now, has it not? Yeah. Yeah, long time. Long time. Yes. Last time I remember you you, you were having your dis differences with, uh, is it Mr. Bear Grylls and the, um, and, uh, oh, my God, I've forgotten the name. With Ray Mears. Ray, yeah. Ray, oh, Ray, one of my favourite outdoor people, and I forgot his name. Sorry, Ray. <laughs> okay. When it was Chris, was Chris was, um, they recorded me from the Bushcraft show and they made all these different programmes and, uh, yeah, so. Uh, yeah, you were just being, you were just being honest. So, John, weren't you? I mean, Bear Grylls, he goes for the more sensationalist style that you, the young people are going to, you know, believe and engage, engage in, I suppose. And But you really were grassroots how to survive, wasn't it? Yeah, you know, I mean, um, that's what I've done for a living. That's what I've done in the army in the end. Like, I taught all survival. And since then, I brought the book out. And everyone who's doing survival now got me book, Chris, you know. Like I say, they've all had me book, and um, it's easy to criticise, but they're all making a living, and like I say, Ray's a nice guy, and um, he's too far one way, and, and I think Bear Grylls is too far the other way, like, and what he teaches is very dangerous, like, you know, and bearing in mind he's the chief boy scout, some of the things, like, you know, it's um, like eating a steak without cooking it, we can all do it, it's sensationalism, you know. It's fine. It's so great you come on the show, mate, because we've been trying to do this for a couple of years, haven't we? And then we've had all this, I call it the nonsense, yeah, um, yeah. that's just screwed everyone's lives over. Yeah, sure. Mate. Well, I'm not in the technology. And to get this on, Chris, like I say, it's magic. And um, I can't believe it's happening. You know what I mean? It's. Yeah. Uh, I'm still a dinosaur. Mobile phones, I... I I mean, they're brilliant, but I ain't got time for them, Chris, you know. Yeah, and that's not a bad thing, mate, really. I I, I try and get away from my phone as often as possible, and it, you kind of inexplicably link to it doing my job, which is, but uh, it's just the way it is. So, Lofty, I don't know what we should talk about first, because everyone who was a young person who liked being outdoors, which we all did back in the day, read your book. Was it the SAS Survival Handbook? That's right, Chris, yeah. Yes. It was, it was like the first of the first, wasn't it? Or, or the, certainly the first of, um, of modern times. Surely. But, it, was, it was unique at the time, like, you know, there's nothing like it. And um, I'll tell you how it came about, like, you know, I was teaching survival in the regiment and um, the course notes were... Well, it was terrible, abysmal, you know, and it was inaccurate. So I thought, the first thing I'll do, I'll get some good handouts, you know. So I started getting everything together, and that was the basics of the book. And I took it to me, Colonel, and he said, look, go and get this published. That was his advice to me. So I added stuff to make it um, applicable to everyone, you know, for all ages. And, uh, and before I knew it, like, I come out of the army and the book was printed, you know, so it, it gave me the pedigree to then open me survival school and uh, I'll never look back. And it's it's still in production now. And uh, that was uh, 19, when did it come out? 1980, 1985, I think it came out. Mm. Still going. I've amended it, obviously brought it up to date, but survival don't change. You know, men's um, physiological needs will never change. It's only new equipment now, like, Mobile phones, GPS, which great survival age, you know, and clothing, 
we now got like lycra, breathable, breathable material, stuff like this, you know. But survival itself don't change. No. So what's our basic need, needs then? Is it shelter, water, food? Food, fire, food, fire, shelter, water, navigation and medical. Yeah. And to put them in priority, this is where we're trying to hammer it like, put, put them in perspective and priority. We use the acronym PLAN. P for protection, L for location, A for acquisition, N for navigation. Protection is first like If he's in the desert and you had two points of water and a blanket, everyone would go for the water, whereas they wouldn't survive under the sun without shelter. Whereas the blanket, put it up, you know, make shade with it, and you can expect up to three days survival time without water with no long-lasting ill effects. So it's getting it in, into perspective. And no matter where you are in the world, the Arctic, the desert, the jungle, the sea, it's always the same, protection, location, acquisition, navigation. And, and that's me, doctrine. That's what I try and get across, Chris, you know. But before all this came around, Lofty, you, weren't you the youngest SAS trooper to pass selection? Yeah, I, um, I joined the parachute regiment 17 and a half and absolutely hated it. I mean, the physical side was great. I was fit, but the, the bullshit was horrendous, you know. And I was always in trouble. My big, being tall, I stood out and I couldn't help grinning even when I was in trouble, you know. So um, I had to make a change. And I met a guy who was an interturley from the um, regiment. The regiment was disbanded in 19, uh, well, after the war, but resurrected in Malaya in 1950. And, and so no one in this country had heard of the regiment. And this lad called Archie was on inter-tour leave. Every three years, they got a, a month's leave over in this country. And I bumped him in, into him one night in order shot. He's waiting to go back to Malaya. And we had a few beers, and he told me about the regiment. said, like, we spent four months in the jungle, and then we don't wash, we don't shave, there's no officers. And we come out after four months, and we got all this money. And 99% we spend on white women and song and we waste the rest. And I thought, this is the life for me. Archie was the biggest lying son so I've ever met, Chris, you know. But when I said to my sergeant major, like, I want to join the regiment, he was delighted. He even in, he helped me to pack, you know, and, I've, and I pitched up down. He was doing lines in Brecon at the time, 1959 now, and I, I was 18. And I passed the election. I was 18. And wow. I, I don't know if it was the youngest, if, if anyone's done it before me or after me, but I was 18 on selection. Mm -hmm. What do you remember, Lofty, being, what do you remember being hard? Being hard? Yeah, what was particularly hard? Well, it's, um, how do I put it? Uh, well, the environment, you know, and the people, depending what you're up against, depending what you're, uh, objective of what, what operation we was on, you know. I found the jungle a delight once you got used to it. Aden was the worst place in the world, you know, so, um, and it, dealing with people is really difficult. So it, the environment, you know, if I put it in perspective, like Borneo, we've done hearts and minds, live with the locals, beautiful people, and it rained every day. And the jungle, people say, you know, they fight it, but it's your, your ally. It, it produces everything. We're Aiden, the locals were against us. There's very little cover. Um, there was no water. And it was difficult, you know. So, it, and life is what you make it, you know, don't matter where you are. Uh, with a bit of knowledge, right? And this is where the old survival schools come in. You can make yourself comfortable. You got to uh, live and, ad and adapt. So all life is hard. And like I say, make it as easy as you can by knowledge. You know, the more you know, the more you prepare and practice, easier life becomes. Mm. Do you think the military is going to change now? Because it's kind of well known, Lofty, that young people don't, not, not all of them, obviously I don't know all of them, but a lot of them don't go outside anymore. Uh, the whole world's changing, Chris. You know, um, um, we, we spent all our time in the forest, in the jungle. You know, that's where the, the enemy was like, you know, but now 
it's worldwide. Um, the whole situation is changing, and the army's got to change with it. You know, um, everyone's got to change. You know, it's call it progress, but uh, unless you change, you're left behind. But I, I find now, like you know, um, kids are more. They're better educated. They've got more imagination, and and they won't be treated like we were, like national service days, you know, where you was abused, bullied, 30 shillings a week, you know, and uh, they cut all your hair off, so to speak. Well, people won't put up with that now, you know, and now I think uh, this generation questions things, you know, why why do we do this? Or have I got to do this? Where in our time we knew nothing else, discipline was severe, and we done what we was told without question. Yes, and... and- Lofty, you were one of the forerunners, or you, 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 one of the guys that made up the team, what we call now an anti-terrorist team. How did that yeah. come around? Um, I was a sergeant major in B squad at that time, and my boss, Duke Perry, um, he was a he was an OC of B squad, and he became the two IC. And one day, he found across in my office. He said, Lofty, we need to put a can hijack team in place and uh, there was trouble at Heathrow and at the time the only thing in the country was the guards used to surround Heathrow with their armoured cars and that and that was the, the the sort of can hijack procedures so we got a team together and uh, I organised that um, we had half the team like we had snipers the assault force and um, all, the, all the equipment and that I laid down the foundation for it with what we got off the shelf, but now it's, um, I've been up the camp and I look and see all the gear, what they got now. And the only thing I recognized really was a gas mask and a, and a, and a lever, a crowbar, like, you know, the technology now and everything they got is superb. But I did start the team off. And this was, uh, and then obviously we come on to the Iranian embassy siege, didn't we? we- were you still serving then, Lofty, or had you left by then? No, I was still in the regiment, and uh, I was not deployed on that at all. Uh, I was back in Hereford watching Stuart on the telly like most people were, but um, it was B squadron again, my old squadron, who went forward and done the successful mission. Hmm. Were, were you very proud of them? Oh, you've got to be. I mean, the trouble with that, Chris, is that from being unknown... Um, unit we had all the world's publicity and the regiment changed from that point onwards really everyone wanted to know about the regiment whereas before the rest of the army looked you know they, they was jealous of us and they see us as um, as troublemakers Ill, Ill discipline everything else you know and, and the rest of the army every time we got involved with them we got into trouble right you know and so after that, everyone wanted to know about the regiment, wanted to join the regiment. It put us on the map, but it didn't do us a lot of favours, really. It was brilliant for the country, but um, it changed our lifestyle forever. Yes, it's, uh, it certainly did. Um, I'm guessing people would have found out about the SAS eventually, would they, wouldn't they? And it, it, like you say, life is changing. What's your relationship with the TV people like then, Lofty? Because obviously being an SAS trooper, you're a no-nonsense person. But in the TV world, it's you know, it's like 80%. It could be 80% nonsense. What, you mean the programmes that are showing now with the ex-regiment members? No, I mean, when, when you've been involved, with, you've done a lot of TV programmes now. Did you... Did you have to like put up, you know, put up with a camp, the camera team being useless or, or getting told, no, you've got to do this again, again, again? Yeah, it was, uh, it was my, my choice to do it. You know, we, we needed publicity. And, uh, and so um, the, it was a whole new experience for us, really. You know, and I, I pitched up the first time I pitched up down in Wales in a studio and I had to wear makeup. Well, uh, you can imagine, like, you know, it was a whole new thing. And and, uh, and all the people I was surrounded by, I come up with my ideas and that. And uh, uh, 
and to be politically correct and everything else is difficult, really. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, we're we different sort of opinions in that. I'll give you an example. Like, um, we was up on that Castleway programme. I don't know if you remember that. And uh, Ben Fogel, lovely bloke. And all Ben done was uh, look out the window and say, oh, beautiful, lovely and that. You know, and the TV said, look, um, he's getting a bit cocky. We've got to bring him down a, a peg or two, you know. And Ben adopted his puppy. And he and all he do one morning stroke the puppy and that. And uh, they said, how can you sort of bring him down? I said, right, what we do, we'll have a party tonight, have a few beers and that, and we'll hide his dog. And in the morning when he's looking for it, we say, oh, when he asked for his dog, we say, well, we had it in the curry last night. But uh, I had ideas like this. This is my idea of good TV, but they, they wouldn't include it, you know. So we did have a clash over things, you know, but like I say, I've got all these good ideas, but no one else thinks so. Because you you took Lenny Henry in the jungle. I took Lenny, yeah. And uh, Lenny, again, a, a nice boat. He'd never been outdoors before, Chris, right? He lived in uh, guest homes, mm. boarding houses and that, where the landladies looked after him. And the deal was to get Lenny to spend 24 hours on his own in a tropical rainforest. So he went up the Amazon. And it's funny how people are, you know, um, when you're deprived of things, the first thing they're looking for, and with Lenny, he had to look good. All I want is food, you know, you know, and um, the base camp was surrounded quickly, festooned with all this discarded clothing. I had what I stood up in, a survival tin, a knife and me, Dixie. And Lenny had a wardrobe, and it, when a hat got dirty, it, it hang it on a branch and that. And when I looked around the camp, there's all his clothing, trousers, everything. And we had to get a grip and say, Lenny, look, one set of clothing. So... But Lenny had to look good, like, you know, and like I say, um, he'd never been camping before. He found it difficult. Um, as soon as we stepped off the boat, they found this big steak, Fangusa, poisonous. But they didn't have the cameras on it, and they miss all the good shots unless you've got the cameras out all the time, you know what I mean? Mm. But I thought, no problem. We'll have the steak. That's our first meal. Brilliant. Lenny wouldn't touch it, you know what I mean? I had to break them in gradually and... Even there, like you know, but he done well, and he finished up. He done his twenty four hours on his own. Mm. I was just not far from him, mind to just to keep an eye on him. But it was a big challenge, and it don't seem a lot, but for Lenny, it was an Everest, you know. Yeah, we forget that, don't we? Being in the military, we just think all this stuff's a bit not normal. I wouldn't even say like I enjoy it all, but I still can do it all, right? But. Um, I do worry these days that, like, if I use my son as an example, it, for his, fir his first birthday present was a bushcraft knife. That was when he was one, right? So he's been, and he's been using it, he's been using it uh, regularly since he was four. You know, always remind him, one rule with a knife, well, other than keep it sharp, cut away from you. Always cut away, and then you... <laughs> then you'll be fine, right? Cut towards your mate. Yeah. He's seven now, and his favourite thing is axes, right? He's axes. Seven. Yeah, he loves oh, axes. He loves the history behind it, the different kinds. He wants to be a lumberjack. That's his... Um... Have you got any furniture left in the house, Chris? He'd <laughs> 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 be wheeling the table leg and that. Yeah, I have to check myself, John, because he'll come up to me with like a nice bit of wood and go, Daddy... Can I carve that? And it, I have to like remind myself that some of these bits of wood, they might look nice, but they're still only like three quid at B and Q. <laughs> so, you know, just, just let him do it. Cause just let, he puts all these shavings everywhere. He doesn't clean them up. So that's the next thing we got to work on. But um, yeah, he handles an ax. He, his favorite thing is to go out and chop, you know, chop wood. That's just his favorite. He's seven, he's seven years old. And I, I'm just trying to do my best, best for him, mate, you know? Ah, lovely. What they learn at that early age, Chris, they never forget. And it, and it does take all through their life. You know, I had all my kids with us when I was running my survival school and they learned, you know, everything I could teach him, you know, and they still remember it. 
all the Latin names of the all the fun guy used to teach, you know. And it is like, and um, they could have taken interest in it, mine, but I tell people, you know, get kids away from their computers, out, get them outside and just introduce them to nature. They'll never, ever be bored. If you can tell them what the tree is, what you can use it for, all the animal signs and that, it's endless, you know what I mean? And it's healthy. And what they learn at an early age, they'll never forget. And now schools, they're doing these outdoor schools in woodlands and that. Kids who struggle in the classroom with maths, English, whatever, take them outside, different environment, and they're more um, receptive. And they and they they shine at the subjects that they can't do in the classroom, you know. And it's all down to environment. And remember, one time we used to live outdoors, and so we knew when the sun set, what the moon was doing, all the nature, how things grew and that. And now we live indoors, unless we still connect with the outdoors, we forget all these skills, you know, our sense of smell. I tell people about awareness, you know, we use all our senses, eyes and hearing, but the sense of smell is so important, especially in the jungle, we can smell things. And the locals, so highly developed, if you cut a tree, they can smell the sap, you know. Mm. And we've all got this um, ability, but we, we lose it unless we practice it. Mm-hmm. So uh, I tell get your kids outdoors. TV is chewing gum for the eyes. You know what I mean? It's all sorts of rubbish. Get them outside. Never be bored, you know, and you introduce them to it. Wet their appetite and they start researching themselves and they're asking questions. And I think you've got them on a winner then. Yeah. Yeah, we got to keep a connection with the nature, haven't we? I mean... It's all right having everything stored in databases and every everything you do every day is digital and it's on computer and or, or, or this. But, like, if the power went down, all, all that's gone. It's all gone. And, and let's be honest, who has a clue about what would you do if the supply chain failed, failed you know, um, fell down. I'm not suggesting it. <laughs> it would be easy for anybody, but like, you know, I think I'd have a rough idea how to get, I think the first thing I'd do would, would be to eat my neighbours. <laughs> well, the, the thing is, Chris, we're, it's a fragile existence at the moment. I mean, Ukraine's kicking off, you know what I mean? Um, already we've had the repercussions of COVID and it's a wake up call, really is, you know, and, as soon as COVID started, I, I thought, okay, dig for victory. I'm in survival mode. I didn't plant any flowers. All my flower beds were full of onions, carrots, spuds, and all the window boxes. And I dug for victory. And we didn't go out. We didn't chop. Uh, we isolated ourselves, men and missus. And we, there wasn't a weed in the garden. It was immaculate, you know, because we spent all that time out there. We had nothing else to do. And, uh, and on power cuts, we take it so much for granted. And we're going back years now, the last time, like, we experienced a power cut in Hereford here, and we all sat around, oh, what should we do? And the kids said, put the telly on. You can't, there's a power cut. Okay, put the radio on. You can't, there's no electricity. And we finish up with candles, which they love, but they've got torches out, and in the dark, they're playing hide-and-seek and games them. And it really excited them, you know what I mean? You know, it was, but we take things for granted, like running water and that. And I say, um, just be prepared. Uh, I've got a pond in the garden, so it's, it's a few thousand gallons of water, you know. Water is so essential to survival, you know, and I've got a supply. I mean, it's good water, but it's still boil it, but, and it attracts everything. You know, I've got fish in there, which is a source of food, obviously, but ducks come and visit. All wildlife guns, including squirrels and that. So as a survival um, standby, you know, being prepared, it's an excellent uh, thing. And I tell people, if you can, have a pond. If you have a fire in the house, fire brigade could just drop a hose in without looking up for a hydrant and put the pond to fight the fire, you know. And again, um, we have a year's supply of food in. All canned goods, some dry goods like flour, Pasta and stuff like this, honey, but all tins, like, you know, and um, you're reason at last year's prices. As long as you turn things over, as you use them, you know, and if you look at a tin of beans, what you bought last year, they probably say 15 pence. 
this year they're 20 pence, you know. So by having all this in the garage or anywhere convenient, in a, I wouldn't say in a loft because like, of the weight, but in a cellar, you know, turn it over regularly. You're never out of food. And when the tools go down or supermarkets shut or whatever, there's no supply in the, in the shops. You've, you've got a good standby. You've got food. So you've got food and water. You've got your shelter, your house. Um, you, you're surviving, you know. Mm. And so it's just good. It's good practice. You know, I'm, I'm not doom and gloom saying there's going to be, a, a you know, a war on that, but it's being prepared. And we always say, what could possibly happen? Have I got a contingency plan? And that's what we try and do, you know. Anticipation is better than cure, you know what I mean? Um, see all these dangers, all these threats, do something about it. Mm-hmm. And say, if this happened, can I deal with it? So, again, it's just little things, nothing sort of um, outlandish. Have a supply of water, have a supply of food. Quitting. Yeah, and yeah. The other thing there that I think gets overlooked is if we did have a food shortage, unless you've got a little supply at home just to soften things up for a few days, people will be going crazy. They'll be going out and the little bit of supply that is there, the odd truck that's still managing, they're going to be attacking them trucks and robbing them. That's going to put that, put pay to that. They're going to be attacking their neighbors and all this kind of stuff. Just having a week's supply of food gives you a weak buffer, doesn't it, to soften everything up and let the, you know, let whatever problem has developed kind of, you know, run its course. Um, yeah, good, good point. I just bought a, I don't know if I got Chris, it here. The, the, the thin veneer of civilization, of civilization, it goes out the window when people are threatened. Mm. You know, um, they revert to type. And like you say, dog eat dog, you know, um, you'd be surprised. So you think, oh, I had the last biscuit maker, so to speak. Goes out the window, you know what I mean? And self-preservation is a very powerful uh, instinct. And uh, like I say, um, if you if you have got a food supply and someone hasn't, you must be prepared to protect it as well, right? You know, so, yeah, prepare for the worst. Yeah. That's why we got a seven-year-old with an axe. <laughs> it don't, don't come through our door. <laughs> not, not even on a good day. <laughs> the postman's got fingers missing. Lofty, there's been some incredible stories of survival. I love, it's my favourite kind of book is to read. Uh, and also there's been some great films made. One of my favourite stories is Stephen Callahan, 76 Days Adrift. Yeah, yeah. Um, the one of the best book, best books I ever, ever read, and there's been some good documentaries made about Steve's story as well. What, um, what stories have kind of taken your interest over the years? Yeah, Shackleton, like he was, he was something else, like you know, and um, um, there's a bloke called Harry Tillman. I don't know if he ever, he's not a lot of people know about him, but. He was ex-army, um, good climber and a sailor, and he sailed around the world on his own, and he, he, would, he would dock and climb the highest peak in that area, you know. A uh, hell of a guy. Uh, he couldn't get on with other people unless they were as good as him, so, so to speak, you know. But all these stories, you know, of survival where a man has cut through his own arm to escape from danger, the family Robinson when they on that boat and they'd done... Uh, rental infusions, return on blood and that. What it does, when we teach survival, like the will to live, which is my firm foundation I build all the training on, what we try and do is nourish this will to live. And using all these stories, knowing what man has done, it, it nourishes this will to live. We're all the same species. Knowing they've done it, we can all do it. It's all within our grasp to do it. Get the idea? And so as long as you're positive mentally, knowing it has been done and we can do it, and this is why I like all these stories, we always uh, try and quote them and um, it endorses and it nourishes this will to live, never giving in. Mm. Would you say in a jungle, machete is 
you don't want to be without one. You know, if he's one of your prime, yeah. Um, uh, we, we call it a parang, like the machete parang, call it what you wish, but the parang was part of our personal weapon. So along with our weapon, what we carried, the parang was equally as important. It was part of the kit, you know, and it was inspected regularly. You, know, you kept it sharp, just like you did your weapon, rust free and that. But um, it is an essential part. With that, you can acquire your food, fire, shelter, water. Get the idea, you know. And it's 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 on a separate uh, lanyard even before you put your belt kit on. So you're never without it, you know. And it's the difference between life and death in many uh, circumstances, you know. And we have another thing, you're only as sharp as your knife. So a blunt paring or a blunt knife, that's where all accidents are caused because people are using it too much pressure, whoosh, splits or slips onto, onto the skin and you've got to cut. Nice and sharp, minimum force, and you get maximum achievement, you know. So the powering, most important, yeah. Have you had any run-ins in, in all these places you've been with dangerous animals or, or potentially dangerous animals, I should say? All the time. The most dangerous animal on earth is man. Yeah, they're unpredictable. Animals, predictable, Chris, you know. Um, I always quote an example, was in Kenya, up country, all sitting around the fire, telling stories. A rhinoceros come in the camp and stamped on the fire. Now, animals are front of fire, but they accept it because there are bushfires in the wild and that, you know. But why this this... Rhinoceros come in and chat and stand on the fire, probably a cold feet, but we talk to the trees. But there's always a contradiction, you know what I mean? Mm. Um, we have a saying, we, we like snakes and all the venom stuff, leave them alone, they leave me alone. I've got to pack my nature. I won't mess with them and they won't mess with me. But we're the intruders, so we've got to fit in with them, not the other way. They're very territorial on that. And if they see us at a risk, you know, that's when you're confrontation. But I've been uh, and that's where again bears, I've been with bears and that. And again, it's avoiding eyeball contact, you know what I mean? Like and the same with people, you know, look, drop it down, peripheral vision, don't run. And I always tell a story, always use your mate. If I'm walking down the road and I get attacked by a wild dog, I tell my mate to run for it and I stand still. What happens? Your mate gets he gets ripped to shreds, get me. But um, all the time, yeah, it's respecting wildlife and that. Um, don't take chances. And people will pick up snakes and play with them and that and, uh, and they come unstuck. So mm. we keep our eyes about me. I leave them alone. They leave me alone. That's, that's my policy. Lofty, do you think the jungle is your favourite environment for... What do we say? Living min minimally? Yeah, I spent all my life in a tropical rainforest, like, you know, like um, Malaya, uh, Borneo, the Amazon, you know, uh, in Africa, the Abadez, you know. I'm a home in the trees. It supplies everything you need. It's full of life. And in the Far East, it rained every day or once a day in the dry season. It rained all day in the wet season, you know. Water sustains life. So there's never a shortage of water. So straight away, you're on a winner. Water promotes life, so all your wildlife, insects, animals. And so the jungle flourishes, you know. And once you get used to it, uh, it's, it's your ally. You know, it supplies everything you need. Um, so out of all the environments, um, the desert, very nice and that, but very hard going. And the harshest places in the world to survive are the extremes, like the cold areas of the world, you know, um, the Arctic, Antarctic, and anywhere altitude above 7,000 feet, you need specialist skills. If I make a mistake in the jungle, maybe cut myself or get sunburned, that's one thing. Make a mistake in the Arctic or a cold climate, I lose fingers, a limb even, or my life, you know. And so we're not meant... Man is a tropical animal. We can only survive where we're born in the tropics. The moment I leave that environment, I've got to provide a tropical environment, i.e. clothing, 
there's no heat in the clothing. Mm. My body produces the heat, and between the layers dictates how warm I am. Whereas if I go to, like, say, Alaska, um, I've got to have all the clothing. I've got to provide that environment. And without it, life expectancy is minimal. You mentioned Shackleton earlier. It, I think it's only if you truly have a deep fascination and interest in life that you can understand what that guy achieved. It was just, it was, it was beyond incredible and it should be taught in, in every single school, just as a, a fundamental of what human beings are capable of when they're put under pressure and they've got good leadership. Sure. I mean, uh, that was it. He was a leader and um, endurance and, and what he achieved, you know, in a cold climate. So, excuse me, easier in the sun than it is in the cold. Mm. You know, so... Uh, for our friends at home, I, I just would strongly recommend read the book Shackleton or, or the, there's been some great like tele doc, you know, drama documentaries on uh, a, a, any of them will give you the idea. But basically he, he had to leave his men on Elephant Island after they've made this incredible sea journey already in, in what was essentially the, the lifeboats of the ship that they converted and he got his men to Elephant Island and he, he left, I don't know, let's just say 20 odd there. And then he made a miraculous sea journey, charting it, navigating it all, all himself. And he got to South Georgia, then walked over the toughest, one of the toughest glaciers on earth. The one that down, I think it was two choppers during the Falklands War when the mm -hmm. SAS got... The second glacier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and Shackleton, in just the clothes they had back in those days, no, nothing fancy. He, Canvas he, and wool. That's yeah. all they had. Canvas and wool. Yeah, and hobnail boot, you know, boots with nails, literally hammered into the sole. He, he got to a whaling station there. Then after they made human contact and got comms, it was another year before they could go back for the guys on Elephant Island. And when they... God, I get emotional just thinking about it. It, 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 it it's just everything a, a, a proper bloke should be. He went back and all of his crew were still alive. Um, they'd been living on, you know, seal blubber and bird's eggs and whatever, you know, I'm guessing uh, shell life and all this kind of stuff. And they turned one of the boats upside down and they just all lived under this boat for a year. Just amazing, Lofty, isn't it? Yeah, he's remarkable. You know, yes. Inspirational, inspirational. But I'll say this to young people listening. I wouldn't want to live my life not knowing these stories. I, I feel such a deficit. Well, I wouldn't because I wouldn't know what I was missing. But I can tell you now, I'd feel such a deficit if I didn't have this rich you know, influence in my life, just, just like John has, John, John has given us over the years, getting young people out there, getting them to use a knife, getting them to catch a few fish, put up a shelter, just, just you know, put, push yourself a little bit into the stuff that actually makes you grow, grow as a person, because you can stay on a tablet for a year and play a game and, at the end of that, you you literally got nothing in the back. You, you might have got a good score, but um, yeah, he said, "Oh, Lofty, we could talk. I'd I'd love to have you on the show again, and we can talk um, for hours. I'll I'll try and focus. No Norway, that's where us Marines all go for our Arctic training. That's uh, the Arctic and Antarctic, like you said, harsh environments." Have you spent a lot, a lot of time at the poles, Lofty? Yeah, um, I, like, I like the mountains, you know. And uh, but to tell you a story, we, we come from Malaya, and four months in Malaya, 
come back to UK, had to justify our, exis- our existence in NATO, and for a um, reward, we got the northern flank up in Norway, 400 miles inside the Arctic Circle, where Finland, Russia, and Sweden come in. And after two weeks in Hedeford, we got posted up there for four months. We were still wearing the same gear as we wore in the jungle, albeit a pair of long johns, one size come up near nipple ends, a big flap in the back with a button. No matter how careful you went for a crap, you always crapped on the button, stopped you biting your nails, Wayne Chris. <laughs> but then the string vest was like a bag of sprouts, you know. On top of that was our OD, OG trousers and jacket shirts, what we wore in the jungle. The old woolly pulley, a parker, and a pair of welder's goggles. And the Norwegian owned oh, the same boots that we wore in the jungle, which was like cardboard or leather, you know. And the Norwegians couldn't stop laughing. They said, you go out like this, it's minus 40 at times, you'll perish. And they had to give us their gear. That's how much we've come on since them days, you know, mm-hmm. because we come from like um, the Far East to the back to this country and we had to learn new skills. And one of them was Arctic warfare. And um, like I say, you make a mistake there, it's tragic. But... Um, we learned a lesson, we've got all the gear now. Uh, I've been to McKinley up in Alaska, great times like that. Um, I love the mountains, but like I say, um, hardest place to survive. You need specialist kit and equipment. Anything with any sense, they migrate. And so the summer's very, very short up in uh, extremes and the uh, food is scarce, you know, and people don't realise it. We need water and we dehydrate in the cold climates, exactly as we do in the hot climates. And although you're surrounded by snow, you need fuel to melt it. And so um, it, it's a hard place and a very harsh place to survive. Mm-hmm. Like I say, um, had brilliant times up there, but you've got to be careful. John, have you slept in many snow caves? Yeah. <laughs> Every night for four months one time, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah I, when we did ours on our train, it, uh, it was the coldest night I ever spent. It was, oh, I was warmer. I was actually yeah. warmer sleeping outside in a snow trench one. We, we built, yeah. a, they call it a cold trench or something, you know? You just dig it, chuck your bag and your bivy bag in. That was fine. In a snow cave, I just remember shivering all night long. <laughs> did, did you have a candle or light at all? Yeah, we had the old candle. What a fucking load of bullshit that is, folks. I <laughs> <laughs> don't believe it. <laughs> if, there, if there's any wind, you're, you're best in a snow hole. If there's no wind, you know, make yourself as comfortable as you can. But it's the wind is the killer. And the reason you go underground is because of the wind. Up on McKinley, like the mountain, you go there before you go to Everest because it's the weather conditions are harsher. And uh, because it's further north there, uh, Everest is in the tropics, you know. And so unless you dig in, the wind will take your, your tent away and everything. And so um, make a snow hole, but the candle, it does get the, it does make um, con- convecting heat, you know, it does move yeah. it around a bit, you know. And and that is your guide, like the old uh, canaries in the mine, if there's no air, you know what I mean? That's the main reason for it. Mm. But like I say, uh, it's hardly central eating, but it is a safety thing. But it's it's what you land as well, right, Chris? You know, it's all right. Um, you must have insulation. You're best having more stuff underneath you than on top of you, and because your body's drawn a heat. And unless you've got a good sort of um, something to lay on, and a reindeer skin is one of the best, and uh, you're cold. But. Uh, John, have you climbed Everest? Never, no. no. I've been out to Nepal many times, done the Annapurna Trail and that, done the trek. But um, it was an ambition and ne- never, no. No. Never I can't even climb the stairs, Chris, you know what I mean? I was going to say, mate, we could climb it together next year, but 
Uh, <laughs> it is a big Chris, ask, isn't it? Chris, they got fixed rates right to the top now. And if you've got enough money, people are, are paying for people to drag them up the top. And I think last year, or a couple of years ago, there was 80 people waiting the summit, you know what I mean? And um, yeah, years ago, just two men had climbed it, you know, so it's outstanding. But it's like nature. If if the mountain don't want you on it, no way will you climb it. You know what I mean? It's um, And it's living with nature and recognising this. And it's a time knowing when to turn back when things ain't going your way and uh, being savvy. Yeah, being cautious. Mm. Yeah. Always risk the least. John, you, you were one of the forerunners of – special forces people being on telly and now we've seen that um i don't buy into this by the way i think you know make off your military career what you can because they don't pay me nothing right <laughs> despite the fact my back is destroyed i don't get no pension i don't get no no one's going to put kid on food on my kids table so i don't mind to spin dits about my time in the military if 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 people like hearing them I don't give away any official secrets and nor, neither do the guys in the, you know, SAS who dares wins. It's just entertainment. Right. But did you get any grief back in, back in your day? Was it, was that uh, ever a thing? I, I always try and bring credit to the regiment, Chris, you know, I won't divulge so good, uh, secrets, any, any skill, operational skills or things like that, you know, and um, I owe the regiment a lot. That's where I learned all my skills. And I try and bring, like, credit to the regiment. Um, and I put it. Um, and I'm trying to get a, like you say, when I wrote my book, I wanted to call it, you know, whatever, survival. But they said it's got to have essays in the title. And uh, I said, I don't want that. And the, and the publisher said, look, are you ashamed? So I thought about this. I said, no, I'm very, very proud. He said, stand up and be counted. So that's what I did. And I, I never tried to write the fact. I can't help me past. I am proud of the past. And like I say, I just try and bring credit to the regiment, you know. And I, I don't want to use it as a stepping stone, so to speak. But I can't help what I've done. And I can't help who I am, you know. And so you use everything to your advantage, like, you know what I mean? And, yeah. Uh, and I see the people now... They go a bit too far, and and, it, and people have got to realise it's supposed to be entertainment. Now, to me, it's not, but um, good luck to the blokes. If they get away with it, they don't have to do it. And if people are willing to watch, this is what you're up against, Chris. You know, it's what people want, and they're very, very popular. So it's giving people what they want, and it's always your choice. If you don't like it, you can turn it off. It's your choice, you know. That's what I say. Yeah. Don't need to hang around long enough to get upset, Lofty, do you? <laughs> Just do that. <laughs> Just turn it off. Yeah. <laughs> and go, go go give the kid another axe and chop something else up, Chris. That's, yeah. That's it. Go and do, as they used to say, and why don't you? Go and do something less boring instead. Surely, mate. Have, have you taught your seven-year-old to light fires yet, Chris? Oh, you took the word. Literally, I couldn't finish this, this <laughs> chat. This chat. <laughs> Without mentioning the Holy Grail, yeah, I, I openly will say here and now, it's the hardest thing I've ever done. One sec. Oh, get my headphones back on. I actually went as far as buying a fire by friction kit on the internet because I've never been able to do it. I'll tell you what, in the end... I had to get the electric drill out for this and I went and I still, still had to resort to a Zippo. Um, it's, it's one of the oldest, most ancient skills. And it's, um, it's also the one that requires the most knack, knack is it not? This is, the friction method. Yeah, ma make, making any kind of fire without a lighter or matches is hard, is, hard, is it not? It is. 
But I was I was the first person to do it really, you know, um, on my survival um, thing, and and now there's people doing it all the time, even in, with a hand drill, which I find difficult. But um, it's just getting the right wood, you know what I mean? And um, but they're doing it all the time now, which is great. But it's all these skills that we used to, do, Chris, just forgotten, you know. And unless you practice them, there you go. But yeah, and abroad, like say in, in Kenya, the wood's so dry, you can pick most stuff up and get a fire going. And it's, a, it's the place where you least need fire. We're out in the Arctic where you do need fire. There's no salt, there's no suitable woods to do it. You know, there you go. <laughs> so it's all, it's Murphy's Law on it, you know what I mean? I'm going to make it my goal to, you know, to actually manage to do it. Like I said, I've tried it many, many times and, and, it, uh, uh, it's, it. it's 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 what I'm trying to say is massive credit to anyone that's ever achieved it. I've seen it done at bushcraft festivals, you know, or bushcraft you're, weekends. You're doing the right kit. But yeah. what I was saying, Chris, is if you teach your seven year old fire lighting, I hope you got fire alarms because my <laughs> kids growing up, one day I, I smelt smoke on the top of the landing. My boy had all the kids from the street and said, Right, lads. This is how you light a fire. And in the waste bin, he had a fire going, you know. And uh, I thought, that's my boy, but it's, it's where they practice you've got to worry about. Yeah, we got a rule in our house. If, if the fire kicks off, just climb out the window. I taught him how to climb out the window. <laughs> we got a window here that it gets out onto the back roof. I'm like, don't worry about the house. We can replace that. We don't mind about that. Just oh, get... Get yourself out, even if you have to smash the window. Just, just, just do it. Yes, Lofty. This has been absolutely amazing chat. Thank you so much, and just a personal thank you for what you've added to my life. That I can now, you know, hand that spirit over to my son. What's what's in the future for you, Lofty? Have you got any stuff coming up? Uh, next Saturday, I'm at the Bushcraft Show. I've done it every year for the last 12 years. I didn't do it last year because COVID interrupted. I had other plans. and But, um, yeah, I go every year, and it is tremendous because you're meeting people. The same, we're all in the same sort of um, frame of mind and that, love the outdoors, um, and it's a pleasure to be there. There's all smiling faces. I feel as though I'm amongst friends, and... Uh, and it's it's a treat for me, so I'm really looking forward to that. I'm still lecturing, you know, my, my tongue works, and I still do lectures and things. And like I say, I've got to sit down and do it. And <laughs> if people are prepared to listen, I'm prepared to talk. So uh, yeah, I'll keep it going, Chris. And uh, I'm always listen, busy. I, John, I don't know if this podcast will come out quick enough for people to hear about, and even if it did, it would be too late for them to get tickets. But for next year, for next year, where is it they go in? Did you say the Bushcraft? Yeah, it's a Bushcraft show. It's, a, it's up in Derby by Lutterworth at the moment. Uh, and uh, it's an annual occasion. If you dial it up on the old internet, it'll tell you where. But uh, it's, it's a lovely show. And um, like I say, I'm, I feel amongst friends. Mm. And if you like the outdoors, there's all the, all the trade stands. And fine lighting demos, Chris, you let it go because the lad who does it is brilliant and he's showing you all the right woods to use, the timbers, the techniques, and it's all down to materials, you know, picking the right materials and uh, it gets you like the fire. And if yeah. you take your boy, your boy will love it. You know, there's canoeing, axe throwing. They have an axe throwing lane. They show you. So, so it would be used in your front door as a, as a dartboard, you know. But, uh, <laughs> yeah yeah oh brilliant brilliant and friends at home we'll put we're going to put links below the podcast so you can find lofty's books so for friends who don't know the military thing lofty is a tall person in the military and it's a nickname very often given in in uh, 
so I, I don't know how much in the army, but in the Marines, it's like, if you're a tall person, you're Oi, lofty. <laughs> so, um, but, but obviously John is John's real name. That's why I'm flipping between the two. Um, we're going to put links to Lofty's website below to his books where you can find them on Amazon. So please get involved, buy your kid one for, you know, instead of buying a bloody game or something, buy your, buy your, your little boy, your little girl, a copy of the SAS handbook and get them out there, get them a knife, get them living life. John, massive thank you to, to you, to you again, sir. Um, stay on the lines. I'm going to thank you properly after I push the record button off, but it's just legendary. To, you, you were actually called the SAS is uh, like the biggest legend in the SAS. And I just want to say, I, <laughs> I, I can completely see why that I just wanted to give that a shout out and um, massive. Thank you for everything you've done over the years. Lofty, just absolute absolutely brilliant to friends at home much love to you all please look after yourself please take some time get out of doors at minimum you just want to walk around the block once a day even if that's the minimum you do to get away from this these bloody infernal computer screens if you can like and subscribe that would be wonderful and we'll see you next time thank you <laughs>